Welcome back to Let's Learn StarCraft, where now we're going to step through every single Protoss unit and talk a little bit about how the units are good and bad. Uh, we just did this with Terran. The big thing that I want to highlight in your mind is that there are some units that you're building all the time. There's some units that are a little bit situational, and there's some that you don't need to worry about in certain matchups. For instance, with Terran, Firebats, you just really do not build in Terran versus Terran at all. And we're going to now look at the Protoss pieces with our favorite cheat codes, Show Me the Money, and Operation Seawall. Let us start with the most glorious of all. The Zealot. The Zealot, the Zealot, the Zealot, the Zealot. Now, Zealots are an interesting unit because they sort of have two phases to them. They start off not actually being great in any of the matchups. They start off as these units which, like, can end the game. Like, a Zealot can show up against a Terran and just kill you. They can show up against a Zerg or a Protoss in your base and just kill you. Because they have ridiculous stats. Look at this, 100 health and 60 shields. They cost 100 minerals. For comparison, two Marines have 80 health. One Zealot has 160 health. And those cost the exact same. So Zealots are insane health-wise. What about damage-wise? Zealots do 16 damage really fast. Like, it, it is hard for me to even convey how insane the damage output of Zealots are. I mean, like, like they attack so, so fast. They deal so much damage. In fact, the Zealot is so strong as a unit that even things that counter it on paper lose to it unless there are good positions or good angles. Um, so you might be confused as to why I'm saying Zealots are not really that great in the early game. The big reason is that they're slow as all hell. They're, they're so abusable by anything with any amount of speed at all. Like, if your opponent has any number of Dragoons, we're just going to have these two attack each other. I mean, this Dragoon can just wander away from the Zealot and endlessly shoot at it, and there's nothing that the Zealot can do. And the Dragoon is not even that fast of a unit. Other things that cause Zealots to get screwed over is um, terrain or good building placement. You'll see Terrans exploit this early game against Zealots a lot. Like, oh god, these Zealots just, uh... Wind up getting stuck and glitching around buildings and you can run this way. I mean, most of the reason why wall-offs exist for Zerg at any point in the game is because it just wrecks Zealots. So this is, this is part of what's weird about the Zealot in the early game. How will you see it used? You'll see players get like one or two or three and then stop. And that's how you should build them in the early game. In all matchups, period. In all matchups. Until you get Zealot Leg Speed. Once you get Zealot Leg Speed, one of the two huge weaknesses of the Zealot is completely circumvented. Look how fast these guys move now. I mean, they're like little rocket ships, man. Units in this game move fast. Look at this shit, man! They move so fast! The two big weaknesses of Zealots are difficulty getting good angles with terrain and slowness. And now, the only problem is just getting difficulty with terrain. So typically what you see with in Protoss vs. Sir, in Protoss vs. Terran, and Protoss vs. Protoss, right around the time that Zealot leg speed gets done, that's when players start with a huge wave of Zealots, and they can begin to do shit. So, the Zealot is often your big mid-game starter unit as Protoss in all the matchups. In Protoss vs. Protoss, you're building a lot of Dragoons early on with some Reavers, and then BAM, you get a bunch of Speed Zealots. If you're against a Zerg, you're kind of turtling back and harassing with Corsairs, and then BOOM, Speed Zealots. Protoss vs. Terran, you have Dragoons and Observers clearing things out, and then boom, Speed Zealots. So weirdly, although the Zealot is the first unit that you get and can do some game-winning rushes, it's a mid-game unit. You build it in the mid-game. And its strengths are just 
amazing in all matchups. It's just so insane. Against Vultures, they're pretty damn good. Technically, Vultures counter them because Vultures have mines and Vultures are fast, but Zealots are good against Vultures if they can get up to them. Zealots are amazing against tanks because they're right there next to them where the tanks are dealing with splash damage. Against Zerg, Zealots are great against Zerglings, pretty solid against Hydras once they have speed. Really struggle against Lurker, really struggle against Plague, really struggle against bad angles. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that sort of bad angle stuff. Um, by taking some Zealots moving out to the middle of the map. Because the Zealot is, is one of the most important units that you can build. Actually, it's just these two. These are the two important units for Protoss. So if you're moving out with a whole bunch of Zealots, and you somehow get blocked by some bit of terrain, like this. This is where you can wind up having these three get picked off by some tanks down here, and these three stay alive. Whoops. Whoopsie daisies. And if you get a lot of... This is actually going to be great. This is like the perfect time for this. Here's something that can commonly happen, is if you attack an army on its point, you'll notice you have to do a lot of moving in towards the army. What's way better for melee units is to hit armies on their sides, so there's maximum surface area. So the Zealots can actually get in there instead of getting all clustered and clumped up. So as we do some more Protoss versus, um, actually anyone analysis, you'll see a lot of discussion about what angles the Zealots are coming in at and what angles the Dragoons are coming in at. So the big thing I just want you to note is that Zealots are a mid-game unit. That's really the big thing. And Zealots are just awesome. In the late, late, late game, you don't want as many Zealots. You don't want as many Zealots. It's better to have um, higher tech units get in there. Specifically, if you're late game as Protoss, you're going to want some Zealots. But it's not like once mid game hits, you want to go maxed on Zealots. This is something a lot of like uh, rising players will mess up. Where they'll build 12 or so Dragoons. They'll start building Zealots, and they'll get to like three control groups of Zealots, which is a lot of Zealots. And then they'll be able to get like one Arbiter. And then they have this like 36 Zealot, 12 Dragoon, one Arbiter army. Which is, yeah, yeah. You, you want to back off and make sure that you're still getting well-rounded, getting some more Dragoons very late, getting some maybe Carriers, Arbiters, High Templar, these sorts of things. Uh, against Zerg, you don't really want ton of zealots late you want like reavers archons dark templar these kinds of things so that's a little bit about the zealot the dragoon the other most important unit you'll ever make dragoons are amazing but not really that amazing until they get the range upgrade this is going to be your most purchase upgrade in the game period you're pretty much always going to get this um dragoons Against Protoss and against Terran, this is your early game unit. Early game against Terran, you're only up against Marines. And a very low amount of mech units. A very low amount of tanks and a low amount of vultures. Dragoons are great against vultures. Dragoons are great against mines, especially with observers. Dragoons are okay against tanks in small numbers. Um... Hajusk, if you could clarify uh, what you were saying. Uh, Hajusk, I'd be very curious. Sorry, I was a comment in the chat. Okay, so Dragoons are very good against holding off pretty much everything that a Terran can do early on. And you might see an army like this. Five Dragoons and a Zealot. Just one. Just a single more Zealot, but not like a huge army of them. And the reason is that Dragoons are just good against... Pretty much anything Terran can throw at you in small numbers. But once you get to mid-game, you kind of need the Zealots to break through the walls to break down the tanks. To break down the mines. And so on and so forth. I feel like there was one more thing I wanted to say about Dragoons. Oh yeah, sorry. In Protoss versus Protoss. Dragoons are great against slow Zealots. 
and there's really not any other unit that you make early game other than Dragoons and Reavers. Like, High Templar, don't get surface area to storm. Dark Templar, you get an Observer, and it's dead. No, There's no air units that are good against Protoss early game, so, I mean, this is... Ah, oh, it feels so good. Hodges, your, your question is extremely technical. I'll answer it after the show. It has nothing to do with what I'm talking about right now. So, um, the... In Protoss for Protoss, you, you build quite a lot of Dragoons, but Dragoons tend not to scale very well once you get into huge numbers. Like, if you get a large number of Dragoons, like 36 Dragoons, it just doesn't do that much because Dragoons have the worst AI in the entire game. Like, if you have even just 12 Dragoons and you tell them to go somewhere, Dragoons will figure out all sorts of weird paths to take. Like this Dragoon wandering all over. You know, guys, go back up the ramp. Let's see what happens. Uh-oh, this guy's going backwards. These guys are going all over the place. There's actually a reason for this. Dragoons, when they're not moving, have a smaller model than when they are moving. So, you can cluster Dragoons together, but the instant you say move, they start to glitch because they need more space to exist as a full unit. And so, probably more important than me even talking to you about the strategy of the Dragoon is like the control of the Dragoon will probably drive you crazy at some points in time, and that's just that's just the way the unit be. Oh my god, I lost, I lost track of my chat. So, in Protoss versus Zerg, Dragoons are, they'll feel really strong, but it's important not to get too many of them. They're a mid-game unit, they're very well-rounded, they're very okay against everything. This is one of the big reasons why Dragoons show up in all the matchups, but they're not really exceptional at any one particular thing. So that's why it's, it's critical not to overbuild them once you're getting to max supply. Um, yeah, that's it. I think a big thing to notice is they should take up a lot of space and their AI is a little weird. Alright. Hi, Templar. Very interesting unit. This is a must-have against a Zerg. This is a, a, a critical unit. Basically, if you're a Protoss against Zerg, you do some shit and then you get High Templar because if you don't have High Templar, you just can't fight. Um, the Gathering. Medieval Man. The big reason it's so essential against Zerg is that you can just storm so many units. So a lot of the way that your game works with High Templar is that you will have a whole bunch of Zealots here fighting at the front, and they'll be Zerg here, or they'll be Zerg here, and you wait for the Zerg to get on your units, and then you storm them there. You never try to storm units that are in motion. Unless there's a really good one, wait till the units start attacking, and then storm them. That's the best time to storm them. Yeah, die, Dragoon. Now, one of the reasons why High Templar is not really that great in a, that many PvP circumstances is that Storm just does not hit that many units because Dragoons are so big. So let's, let's put some pieces together that I've been talking about earlier. When are Zealots good? In the mid-game when they get legs. Because then they can actually get surface area and start dealing damage. In case you didn't know, a Zealot beats a Dragoon in a one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, like, Zealots are just so freaking powerful. We even give an extra shot to the Dragoon, man. Oh, it's going to be close. But what do you know? A9's right again. Um, so in the mid-game, when there's a lot of Zealots rushing in to hit your Dragoons, this is when it's important to have High Templar to storm their Zealots. That's what Storm is for in PvP, is storming on Zealots in order to try to preserve some of your units. Um, against uh, Terrans... Storm is 
the least important of the three matchups in uh, Protoss versus Terran. You can not get Templar, but occasionally they will show up because there will be enough siege tanks kind of clustered together that you can just get a good enough storm. But for the most part, storm is not a big thing. It's very situational. Like you'll have a shuttle with like three Templar in and you'll unload them to storm on the tanks, that sort of thing. We'll talk more about that when we get to the shuttle. But um, again, against Zerg, it is an essential thing. Wait for those units to attack. In PvP, very important to storm the Zealots. Um, in Protoss versus Terran, occasionally you want to use them to storm onto tanks, but not as much. Storm is also great in a shuttle just to run up to the worker line because one High Templar and one Zealot can ruin a worker line. You drop the one Zealot first to start taking damage, and then you just go Storm and Storm, and all his workers are dead. There is a there is a, a, a reload time for Storm. It's not just instant, but no big deal. Ah, yes, the Dark Templar. Important things to note about Dark Templar right now, it has 40 shields, 80 health, and it costs 125, 100. Zealots have 60 shield, 100 health. DTs are flimsy on the Protoss scale of things. Flimsy, 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 flimsy. But they do one-shot workers. Come here, volunteer worker. Oh, they one-shot one Protoss and Zerg workers, that's for sure. Uh, Terran it takes two hits, but it's still scary. Dark Templar have a really interesting identity for Protoss. They are built as annoying harassment control units in all three matchups in the opening game only. Um, they're not like mid-game control harass or, or much in late game compositions. The big identity for these are I'm going to build a Dark Templar and when I get to your base you better have detection or you lose. And if you do get detection, that probably derailed you long enough to where I have an advantage now. So, for instance, um, I, I really find playing against Corsair DT as a Zerg player really, really annoying. Because I'll have to clutch all my overlords up together here in my base. And then I have no vision. I can't see anything at all. He didn't kill me. But he controlled me, he zoned me in, and that's what really makes DTs good. Um, don't get addicted to these units, just don't. Don't. DTs give you a lot of free wins, because players just fuck up and don't have detection. But don't, don't become overly addicted to them. Um, it's important, if you ever go DT, to try to figure out how to transition away from them. Only build, like, one or two DTs early game. Not, like, six. Don't very DT it, okay? Um, the more common use for the Dark Templar is you will see DTs built to slip in to hit workers if there's a lot of bases on the map. So, you know, if I'm Protoss and I have this base and this one and... And then I'm also taking this expansion here or this expansion here. Hell, look at this. Our computer AI is taking the center. He's taking this left base. He has his natural. This is where Dark Templar shine when there's lots of bases on the map. Where I can do something like this, like take this Dark Templar, send it over here, and then send it down to this expansion. Cheat disabled. There we go. Um, that is the most common mid-game usage. This is just a harassment unit. There's one circumstance where you do see DTs built as an actual combat unit, and that is late game against Zerg. It's great to have a few Dark Templar in the mix, because Dark Templars counter Ultralisks very, very nicely. They just deal so much damage. But most of the time it's this. It's doing annoying harassment things like this. While you have forces doing stuff elsewhere. Man, look at this. Look at this response on this AI. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, so even though these are the four ground units, we have more to explore, eh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Archons, baby. Oh, yeah. 
Now, a big reason why you'll see Zealot High Templar or Zealot Archon is that Zealots cost a lot of minerals. High Templar cost a lot of gas. It's about the economy management, right? Spend all your gas on the High Templar, spend all your minerals on the Zealots. The Archon as a unit is the Zergling Destroyer. It almost one-shots a Zergling. Almost one-shots a Zergling. And if you have two of these puppies going, you're just mowing through them. Um, so if you are against a Zerg player, you'll often get a f like a few Archons early as a sort of like helpful support for Zealot unit. I think it's very easy if you're a new player to become overly obsessed with how good Storm is and to never build Archons. I encourage you to, with your first two High Templar, unless your build specifically demands that you get Storm, just get an Archon. Just get an Archon. It's great. Um, one of the big reasons why Archons are very popular with Zealots... Oh, are you kidding me? Get me out of here. Let me out. One of the big reasons why Zealots and Archons feel really nice together is that they're about the same speed. The Zealots are a little bit faster than the Archon, but you'll notice that this lets them line themselves up in a nice angle. I hate how much Terran there is on this map. I really hate it. And I have now solved my problem. Great. Zealot Archon is very nice as an aggressive composition against Zerg. Um, Archons are also very efficient in terms of supply. You know, like, Archons only take up four supply, which is, which is pretty damn low. So you can wind up in these really nice situations late game where you have a ton of Archons. Against a Zerg, Archons are the scary late game unit. Oh my god. God, is it terrifying to have so many Archons to go up against the Zerg. I mean, it's just... Ugh, 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 God, I'm shuddering thinking about it right now. Um, but in the mid-game, you generally build like one, two, three, just like a few Archons. Um, against Zerg, you build one, two, or three, and then late game, you have a lot. Against Protoss Archons, you, you, you only see again in the mid and the late game, and they're really the Zealot Killers. Dragoons are amazing against Archons. So if there's any amount of Dragoons just target firing them, eh, kind of sucks. But Archons are the things that kill the Zealots. I want my Archons and Zealots to kill your Zealots. So now my Zealots are on your Dragoons. So then they die. Um, Archons don't build these against Terran. Don't. Everything Terran builds destroys Archons. Shields take full damage from everything, so vultures that dealt 20 damage, full damage to Archons. Siege tanks that deal 70 damage, full damage to Archons. EMP will remove all of the shields, leaving the Archon with 10 health. The only thing that Archons have late game against Terran is they don't set off mines, but they still suck. Don't build Archons against Terran. Only if you really know what you're doing do I give you permission to do that. Now let's talk about a unit that you should pretty much never build. The Dark Archon. The Dark Archon has three abilities. The first is called Feedback. And this is exactly what you think it is. It deals damage. It deals damage proportional to how much mana something has. So this has 50 mana. If I feed back it, all the mana is gone. It burns the entire mana pool and it deals it back as pure damage. So, whoosh, there it is. Do you ever use this? In one situation. In one. Which is where in Protoss vs. Protoss, often if you just wander up with a Dark Archon, you can pick off a whole bunch of their High Templar like it's nothing. So that's great. That's great. It's a great way to, if you're getting ready for the big fight, you feedback, feedback, feedback. Um, second ability is called... Wow, I didn't realize this was the second one. Second ability is Mind Control. It's exactly what you think it is. It gives you control of another unit, including an SCV, including you can build an entirely second race. This rarely happens. There is only one reasonable place when this happens. 
which is ultra late game. Ultra, like, ultra, ultra, ultra late game. Which is where there's pretty much guaranteed to be no more money on the map. So you build a bunch of Dark Archons to begin mind controlling his units. That's basically it. The last one is weirdly the most commonly used ability for the Dark Archon, but it's still rarely used, which is Maelstrom, which is for, let me build some Dragoons in here, for biological units only. And which units are biological? It's the ones that don't look like they're machines. Like Dragoon is a giant mechanism, a Zealot is a dude. If you cast Maelstrom, the units are stunned. They can still be attacked, but they're stunned for about 8 seconds. I think it's 6, given that. So Dark Iron, you, you really never build, ever. Really never build. I realize I forgot to talk about Hallucination here. Uh, hallucination is an ability that you cast it on a unit, and it summons two copies of it. Now, these copies don't deal damage, and they take extra damage, as you can tell. They also have a time limit that's pretty surprisingly long. And there is, again, exactly one place where this is used commonly. And this is actually increasingly pretty damn common. Arbiters will come to in a little bit. But you want to use Arbiters in late game Protoss vs. Terran. But the Terran's always trying to pick them off. So if you hallucinate a whole bunch of them and kind of spread them like this, it's not clear to him which one is the key arbiter. This is how it's used. So now I can fly freely over turrets and know that I'm going to be okay. Are you serious with this shit? Die. You know what? Storm you. This is the theme of this entire show, is going to be the computer coming in and wrecking my shit. Since we're at it, let's talk about the Arbiter. The Arbiter is the ultimate late game Protoss vs. Terran unit. Also, winds up getting used in the very late game of Protoss vs. Zerg and Protoss vs. Protoss, because it's just so good. It does three things. One is, it makes everything underneath it invisible. So you need detection to be able to see it. The second thing, and part of the reason why I was just showing off Hallucination, is an ability called Recall, where you fly, you you select the Arbiter, you hit Recall, and then it just teleports everything nearby that Recall point to directly underneath the Arbiter. Now, Recall is super commonly used. Oh, by the way, the detection is really, the invisibility, is just primarily used to be annoying. If your opponent gets caught with their pants down and they don't have detection, you just instantly win the game. Uh, but most of the time you're against someone who's competent, so they'll just be forced to scan and be forced to have science vessels and shit. So here's why Hallucination pairs well with Recall. When there's lots of bases up, when there's lots and lots of bases up, you'll sometimes want to attack one but can't quite get in there, so no problem. You just recall your whole damn army into the base and kill it. And if you have two hallucinated arbiters, they just don't know which one it is. Very common in late game Protoss vs. Terran, because Protoss has this whole, whole map, and Terran has this whole map, and Terran has mines and tanks everywhere, so you just slip around the sides and just keep recalling into his main base, recalling into his expansions, and so on and so forth. The last ability is my favorite ability. Um, it's called stasis. What you do is you target an area, and everything gets locked in stasis for a minute game time. Which I believe is like 37 seconds. It can't be attacked, can't use abilities. Look how long this lasts, dude. Look at how long this lasts. I mean, I think, I think it's like 30 seconds and change. Because it was 60 seconds of the base game speed, but no one plays it at the base game speed. They all play it at fastest. Look, look at, they're still stasis, okay? They can't take any damage. They can't do anything. 
They're in stasis. There we go. All right, cool. What's up? Now, you, you already see some really dirty combos that can happen. You recall into someone's base. You go to their ramp. You, Oops, I didn't mean to recall you. Excuse me. You go into their base. You stasis a unit on the ramp, and then you kill their main base, and they need 37 seconds of time before this is up. <laughs> ah, that's so fucking sick! More commonly, though, um, it's if there's a big clump of tanks, you stasis them, and they're out of the fight. If there's some ultralists, you stasis them, and they're out of the fight. You see, oh, it's 44 seconds on Liquipedia. That's great. I mean, it's forever. It's forever. Look, I'm wrong on the specifics. It's forever, but that's correct. Arbiter's an amazing, amazing, amazing unit. Just amazing. Um, most commonly in Protoss vs. Terran. A little bit less so in the other two matchups. Alright, so we've done all the gateway units since we started on air units. We may as well just get another air unit out of the way. This is a scout. Don't build them. Do you have any other questions? Don't build these. Don't build scouts. Just, just don't. Just don't build scouts. Okay. Scouts are the most overcosted unit in the game. It's 275, 125. Um, here, here's why you shouldn't build them. They're so expensive, and they, they deal the same damage to ground that wraiths do. They deal 8. Get them. Woo, that was exhausting. Oh god. They they suck, man. They don't they don't do anything. They just they don't do anything. However, I will note they deal a lot of damage to air. Let's build another arbiter. Dude, look at this. Arbiters take so long to build. 160 seconds. These deal 28 damage to air and look at how fast they shoot. Scouts, paradoxically, are the best anti-air in the game, especially against big ships. Like Arbiters, like Carriers, like Battlecruisers. Scouts are insane against other air units. But you never wind up in the situation where you could comfortably build them anyways. So, it's sort of this invisible units. Um... Goliath with range, how does it compare? Well, the reason the scout's better is not only does the scout deal just an absolute insane amount of damage, in terms of the DPS, it's really close. I think the scout still edges it out, but the big thing is that scouts can actually track down air units that are running away, and Goliaths can't. Moreover, scouts have the property that all flyers have in StarCraft, which is that they are permitted to stack on top of each other. Which you can especially see if you are using magic boxing. Yeah, so you can just get like super dense stacks of units just going up and. Bye. Now, here's something that's hilarious Scouts actually have two upgrades in this game. You're never going to build a scout, so you're never going to use these upgrades. But one of them is the Gravatic, or excuse me, the Gravitic Thrusters, which is a scout movement upgrade. And then scouts actually book it. They're suddenly very fast. And they also have a scout vision range upgrade. And when you get these, man, look at this. This vision is friggin' enormous. This is so much vision. Look, this is amazing. Awesome, huh? Really awesome. Listen, don't build this unit. Are we serious with this shit right now? Build some DTs to protect this. Excellent. Alright, well. Let's get these scouts the hell out of here. Ah, yes, the Corsair. Corsairs. Beautiful unit. Just a lovely unit. Built essentially only against Zergs. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you the one use for scouts. Occasionally, scouts are used... Um, when opening against Zerg as a sort of fake-out thing, you get a scout because it kills overlords incredibly quickly, and it can harass drones. Many times, you will see Zerg players uh, build, like, a spore, cluster their overlords around the spore, and now they're safe from Corsairs, but a scout can suddenly now shoot at the drones. 
but the only timing window in which this is legitimately good is if you are doing a one base rush to scout. I think that's the only time where you can actually do that. Um, don't build scouts. Now, Corsairs are super fast. They have pretty good uh, stats in terms of health. They deal a super fast 5 damage, like this. And each of those attacks actually deals area of effect damage. So if I put two scouts next to each other, you'll see that both of them are taking damage. Oh, actually they're not both taking damage because it's friendly fire! Ah! Okay. Splash is not friendly fire in this, but trust me, these deal these deal splash damage, the neutron flare. And so, Corsairs uh, are significant against Zerg for um, two big reasons. One, they can kill overlords. So this was the Bisu build. This was Bisu's brilliant revelation. That you can build Corsairs, and even if the Zerg builds no air units, you wander around with a death squad of Corsairs killing off overlords, and then Zerg can't build anything, and is losing tons of money. And you're getting vision of exactly what he's doing. Ugh. Corsairs, I, I can't stand Corsairs, man. Uh, the second thing that they're very good against with Zerg is they're unbelievable against Mutalisks because Mutalisks cluster together. Um, it's very, very, very powerful. Very, very good. If you're Protoss and you run out of Corsairs, you're very vulnerable to Mutalisks. It becomes very scary. Now, um, this Disruption Web icon, which looks like something that's a little vulgar, is the ability that Corsairs get called Disruption Web. And the way Disruption Web works is that anything under Disruption Web cannot attack, period. So my Dragoon is under Disruption Web and I try to attack this. Nothing. Just turns it off. And now he's back. It doesn't last terribly long. Corsairs are extremely situationally used against Terran because the tanks siege up and you just turn the tanks off. And then you can whack at it with Dragoons. Extremely rarely used. Only on, um, what was the name of the map? Arkanoid in the Pro Leagues. Was it common to see in PvT? Because other than that, Corsairs don't really do anything. Now, if you're given the choice, if someone is building a whole bunch of battle cruisers and you're like, oh my god, I need to get good anti-air, let me get the Corsairs against the battle cruisers. Don't no, they're really really Corsairs are only good against the Zerg air units. Uh, Terran's not really going to be building that much air. Well, oh, I'm sorry. There, there's one situation where you will, will build them against Terran, which is that if you have a huge carrier army and you're worried about wraiths killing your carriers, you can throw in a few Corsairs. You can throw in a few uh, Corsairs, and you'll just easily pick all those things off. So that is the Corsair. Shit, there's one more w w place where Corsairs are used. Um, you heard me talk about how Corsairs are really good against Zerg air units. Corsair Reaver is a common composition um, in Protoss vs. Zerg. And what you'll do is you'll unload all your Reavers, and then when Hydralis come up to hit the Reavers, you'll do this shit. Which, as a Zerg player, drives me insane, because now I actually can't shoot at the Reavers. And then you run away. Oof. Alright, the carrier. Carriers are a very strong situational late game unit. In all matchups. But especially Terran. And then lesser so Zerg. And even lesser so Protoss. But Corsairs are awesome. Excuse me, carriers are awesome. Because they fire out interceptors. And once the interceptors are out... You can move the carriers quite far away, and they'll keep shooting at that target. Notice that when I right-click, it will acquire range as I'm floating over. Oh shit, I didn't hit A-click. If I A-click this, they'll acquire range just by the, the edge of this, but I can back up even more, and they'll keep on firing. So this is what's known as the leash range of carriers. So this is why you'll see players do this, where they'll move out, 
and then they'll back far away again until that unit's dead, and then they'll advance forward and pick it off and back away and wait for this unit to be dead. Dart forward, back off. Extremely powerful. They start with four armor. Nothing starts with that high of armor. They just don't take damage from a lot of things. Well, by the way, the way armor works is you just take the damage that you took, subtract the armor, done. So carriers are super, super good, especially if they get into high number counts, like six or higher. Becomes very hard to deal with them because they can exploit terrain like this really well. Sort of walk out, pick off tanks and things that are over here. Very, very annoying. The thing that makes them difficult is that they're expensive as hell. Interceptors are 25. Oops, I didn't get the carrier capacity upgrade. And if I'm attacking this, interceptors don't actually have very much health. It's 40-40. <laughs> That died fast, but it's very easy for your interceptors to die all the time, and then you're constantly rebuilding them. So you generally need quite a good economy, specifically minerals. I mean, carriers are just ridiculously good. They're very good against Terran, because Terran wants to be building tanks and vultures. The fuck? Get out of here. Um, carriers are very good against Terran because Terran wants to be building tanks and vultures. Tanks and vultures are what he wants to be building. So you build carriers, which are really good against all those because none of those can shoot up. And now all of a sudden, Terran has to build Goliaths. And then I have Dragoon Carrier High Templar, which is really good against Tank Goliath. So this is one of the big reasons why carriers are so popular in the matchup, because you can just catch a Terran off guard and kill him. Um, against Zerg, you kind of have to be careful with transitioning into carriers, because Zerg can just kill you so easily if you're spending a bunch of money and time doing something else. So yeah. Um, carriers, if you open Corsair Reaver and you get a lot of bases, now you're okay. Now it's okay to go carriers. Now in Protoss vs. Protoss, it's just super technical and hard and light and don't even worry about it. You just don't see them that much in PvP. So great, we've gone through all the air units. We've gone through all the ground units. That just leaves one more production facility's worth of units to discuss, which is the Robo. Now I'm going to build an observatory, because this is important. And we will start with the observer. Critical unit. One of the most commonly built in all matchups, the observer. Um, when I'm doing the matchup-specific videos, you'll see when and where I'm telling these observers to go scout. Uh, but the big thing is that observers are themselves invisible. And they are detectors. So they're the perfect thing to build early to go look at uh, mines perfect thing to build to go hunt down mines with. In terms of where the observers should go, in all your games, I want you to overbuild observers. I want you to get like four or five a game. Because a lot of times players will do this, where they'll build one observer over their army. They'll have another observer. You know what? They won't. I lost it. I lost my other observer. He's gone. There he is. They'll have one floating over looking at the enemy base, and they'll have no other observers. It's super, super unbelievably good to just send observers out to various paths nearby. You'll quickly learn that the slower you are, and the more difficulty you have with your hand speed, the more convenient it is to have these observers way far out, because you'll see armies way sooner, and you'll have more time to react. Pros build tons of observers that just do this. Look at the very first analysis video I did with Stork versus Fantasy. Stork has observers all over the place. There are two upgrades that are purchased for observers, and they're surprisingly often 
purchased. I mean, they're not super frequent. If you never buy them, you'll still be okay. But observer movement. Wow. The observer movement upgrade is really important against a Zerg. Because Zerg will constantly try to snipe your observers. Constantly, constantly, constantly. And to be able to avoid Scourge and avoid Hydralisks, you get the observers uh, with speed. This is less purchased, but observers have sight range. Or if you purchase them, they actually get quite a significant boost in sight range. I mean, you can just see on the minimap. I mean, just look at that beautiful, enormous swath of vision. This is sometimes purchased in late game Protoss vs. Zerg and late game Protoss vs. Terran. Critical unit. Does one Scourge kill one Observer? Yeah. Yeah. Shuttle. What a beautiful unit. Now, please do not forget that at the Robotics Support Bay, you can get the Reaver... Sp or, excuse me, the... Uh, Oh, wow, it's also, it's also called Gravitic Drive. That's the shuttle speed movement upgrade. And then shuttles actually move very quickly. Do note, though, they have a very slow acceleration. You can get it to go faster if you wiggle it a little bit. You can see that if I, like, spam it a little bit, it'll speed up a little more quickly. But, uh... Shuttles are really critical for two things. One is just doing basic harassment. Like, I want to go drop a worker line. So I'm going to go drop over here. The other thing that they're really good for is with your main army, keeping High Templar or Reavers inside of it. So that way you can drop and storm without worrying about getting picked off by EMPs. Um, that's one of the big uses for them, are these sorts of defensive, move the slow unit around. And we'll talk about the Reaver in a moment, but Reavers are fucking slow. So having a shuttle that is swiftly darting around, carting this guy everywhere, is super nice. Just let him shoot, pick him back up again. One of the things to note is that because shuttles have an acceleration and deceleration, try to have them moving when you go to pick something up. So that way you can retain its full speed. I'm not good at it because I don't play Protoss, but I know it's what you're supposed to do. So that's a big thing that, re or that shuttles are all about, is doing harassment and helping manage these more obnoxiously slow units. Um, another thing that they're very commonly used for is to load up zealots and then drop them onto tanks. And then the tanks deal damage to each other and your shuttle is the big MVP. In terms of when to actually get this speed upgrade, if you're doing early reaver harassment, you're probably going to want to get shuttle speed to make sure that you can maximally get in and out with your reaver. The rest of the time, only really get this mid and late game against everyone. Um, like, oh yeah, in Protoss vs. Protoss, getting shuttle speed for your Reavers definitely happens in mid game a lot. Some people will skip it. It's totally okay to get. Great. But I mean, it's basically an air transport. Use it to do air drop harassment and also to cart around uh, some of these key units. Also, Zealots are good against Terran. Now, Reavers are a super interesting unit because they function very differently in all the matchups. Um, for Terran, they're good basically only in the early game. Once you get later, Reavers are only good. Or once you get later, tanks destroy Reavers, vultures destroy Reavers. Everything just destroys the shit out of Reavers. Um, but, oh, there's my water. Oh, my God, I was getting so thirsty. Yeah. However, 
Once you get to the early game, Reavers are terrifying against Terran because they can pick off workers, they can pick off small numbers of tanks and vultures. So you'll see a lot of Protosses open Reavers against Terran, but you'll never see them later on. Reavers against Zerg have a really interesting arc. They're okay early, but they're critical once you start getting into late game. Critical, 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 because they, the scarabs that do this, that explosion is melee damage, which means that explosion works under Dark Swarm. And the Reaver explosions deal tons of damage to Ultralisks, which is the big thing. Reavers are okay outside of that situation, but they're really critical. Um, and again, against um, Protoss, Protosses will start off with Reavers because they're just kind of the strongest AoE unit in, in small numbers, but slowly that'll phase out and more gateway only units will be built in the matchup. So Reaver is kind of firmly in a support role, probably one of the most important late game units in Protoss vs. Zerg though, I will absolutely say. So what I'm going to do is, what the hell has been happening on the rest of this map, man? Oh my god, Every, everything's been blinded, absolutely everything's blind. <laughs> what I want to do is just recap in terms of the matchups. In Protoss vs. Terran, you're building pretty much Zealots and Dragoons. And then you're going to be supported by Arbiters. And in the mid-game, you might have some shuttles doing drops on tanks. That's basically the matchup. Against Zerg, you're getting Corsairs to deal with air as a big stepping stone to building a nice mixture of Zealots, Dragoons, High Templar, Archons, all of these gateway units. And then you round things out with a bunch of Reavers. In PvP, you start Dragoon, Reaver. Then you build a whole bunch of Zealots and High Templar and Archons and round out to a composition that looks kind of similar to what you're doing against Zerg. Protoss tends to be a very muscular race in that the Zealots and Dragoons are really the ones doing the work. They're very much just big, meaty, thick, powerful armies blasting down your front door. So hopefully this has clarified some of the identities of the units. And now we're going to take a brief break while I get ready for the Zergs.